In 1921, Dr. William Henry Griffith Thomas, an outstanding Anglican scholar and professor of Old Testament exegesis at Wycliffe College in Toronto, Canada, met with Dr. Lewis Sperry Chafer to consider and pray about creating a new seminary. In 1924, those prayers were answered with the Evangelical Theological College, later to be called Dallas Theological Seminary. Unfortunately, W.H. Griffith Thomas died that same year, but the lectureship that we begin today is a memorial to his commitment to the ideals of Dallas Theological Seminary. Each year, qualified lecturers are selected alternately by each of the divisions of the seminary, biblical studies, theological studies, and ministries and communications. The lectures consist of the presentation of scholarly papers on the topics not normally covered in the seminary curriculum or at the same depth. This year, our speaker was selected by the Department of Old Testament Studies in the Biblical Studies Division. The annual lectures are generally published in BibSAC, the seminary's quarterly theological journal. Over the years, many noted scholars have presented the Griffith Thomas lectures, such men as Henry Ironside, Frank Gabelon, Francis Schaefer, J.I. Packer, F.F. Bruce, and Bruce Metzger. This year, it is our privilege to have with us Dr. Douglas Stewart, who will continue in that excellent tradition. Dr. Douglas Stewart received the Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard College in 1964. He spent two years in graduate study at Yale Divinity School and then returned to Harvard University in 1971, where he earned a Ph.D. degree. He currently serves as the professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, where he has been since 1971. Professor Stewart is a scholar of the Old Testament, Assyrian and Babylonian languages and literature, and the cultures of the ancient Near East. He controls the use of 14 different languages, both ancient and modern. At Gordon-Conwell, his courses include areas such as biblical languages, exegesis and interpretation, Old Testament survey and legal documents, and the historical, prophetical, and poetical books. Professor Stewart is active in several organizations and has served as co-chair of the Old Testament Colloquium of the Boston Theological Institute, Consortium of Boston Seminary and University Biblical Professors. He also has authored articles in major journals, anthologies, and many, many magazines. In addition to pastoring several churches in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, Professor Stewart has preached and taught worldwide. He is currently the senior pastor of Linebrook Church in Massachusetts, and he has had many short-term missions trips and frequently ministers to gypsies in Eastern Europe. He and his wife, Gail, have eight grown children. They reside in Bradford, Massachusetts, and have two tree farms in New Hampshire. Dr. Stewart, on behalf of the faculty and the student body, we welcome you to Dallas Theological Seminary, and we look forward to your ministry to us this week. Would you please join me in welcoming him to the platform today? I am so glad to be at Dallas Seminary. This is one of the few places I could give this particular series of lectures. <laughs> I couldn't give them at my own seminary alma mater, Yale, because first of all, almost nobody would show up for chapel, and secondly, the couple who knew any Hebrew would only be first-year Hebrew students and wouldn't be able to follow it all. I couldn't give them at my uh, college and doctoral alma mater, Harvard, because first of all, Almost nobody could find the chapel, and, and then the, the only two people who might come would be faculty members just there in order to try to create a crowd. So uh, this is great to be able to come to a place where many of you know Hebrew, many of you are studying Hebrew right now, uh, many of you will have the chance later to take it even if it's not part of your program now. Uh, but all of you love the Word of God. I know you wouldn't be here if you didn't understand that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is precious to us, and we live on it 
It, it feeds us and is so important to us. So it's just wonderful to be able to speak to people who understand what's going on. And there's a, another reason that's also nice. If I make mistakes in trying to come up with what I think are some real mistranslations, this eminent faculty is just going to correct it. <laughs> they'll be real nice to me till I get on the plane on Friday, and they'll set you straight. So it's good. I mean, I really do appreciate that. What we want to be is right. We don't want to look good. We don't want to achieve something by way of notoriety. What we want is to be right. We want to tell the truth. And I'm going to try to tell the truth today, but I might be wrong. Um, I've been a translator in, involved in so many translation projects. I was working on the original uh, translation of the NIV back in 19. 71, so that's 42 years ago, and have worked on other translations as a professional and contributed to a variety of them and been a consultant on various stages of the NIV and, and some others as well. I've written study notes for all kinds of uh, Bible editions and so on and published a lot, but I know I'm wrong. In fact, one time I sent an email to uh, the editor of a uh, translation project that I was working on, and I said, could you possibly change uh, wherever I said such and such to this now that I've decided I was wrong? And uh, so I know, I know what it's like. I've also gone back in books that I've written for the second edition and just, in, uh, just put in the words, obviously not, into one or two of my sentences. <laughs> So I know that this is uh, an attempt on my part to say something, and I'm, so I'm, I'm asking in advance for forgiveness if by any chance this isn't right. But I'd, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to contribute something to you in your love for the Word of God. I'm hoping it's going to happen. Now, today we start with a, an introduction to the issue of getting it right. Why do translations sometimes fail? Why do translators like me often fail, and um, can we diagnose that, and can we sharpen our skills and get better so that we don't continue to make those same mistakes? <coughs> so I have an introduction today, uh, a little bit about uh, something that I've called David's lamp, and I'll explain that in, uh, very soon, and then uh, a rather famous wording in the Bible about a still, small voice. And I want to talk about that and why that may also be a mistranslation. Now, uh, I've got examples, and I'm hoping that they're going to be useful, that they're going to… What I'm interested in primarily is not to say, hey, here are some mistranslations, but to say, why? Why do these things occur? Why do people who really, really know their languages still do this? Why do I, who teach Hebrew and Aramaic and Syriac and Targumic, Aramaic and so on. Why do I blow it every once in a while? Even in class when I'm reading something and the student says, well, th where did you get that? And I say, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, please forgive me. I, I, I was thinking of something else, like my tree farm or something. Anyway, <laughs> it can happen. It can happen. So that's what we're interested in. Now, you know, I'm a pastor also. I have pastored longer than I've taught. I've taught for 42 years at Gordon-Conwell, but I've pastored several years longer than that, always been pastoring. So I know from thousands and thousands of encounters with people that many people find it really hard to understand why can't the translators get it right? Why are there problems in translation? Why am I in a Bible study and the person next to me is reading something and I'm reading something else? How does this happen? Uh, so they want to know, and thus my own experience as a translator is part of the reason for these lectures, and I am so delightful, delighted to be in a place where you guys uh, will appreciate, I think, what I have to say. And even if it's wrong, you'll say, aha, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so that's always a joy. Now, you know, as a translator, as a pastor who is a translator, as a youth leader who's a translator, as a person who works with the Word of God and has taken the trouble to look up some things in a passage as you're leading that Bible study, you can't just be right. When Ralph says once again, 
But my version says you cannot just say, well, Ralph, yours is wrong. You can't do that. You've got to be clear, patient, fair, charitable. You've got to love people. We have to love our neighbor as ourself, and that includes these jerks who come to the Bible study. <laughs> Don't tell any of them I said that. So, you know, if you want to explain something, it really is we're dealing human to human, and that's important. And I, I hope that you'll sense that that's my attitude today, even though I do intend to say some things rather uh, firmly. So, whatever I say <coughs> this week, I expect some of you will be disappointed by. Some of you will be suspicious of it. Some of you will say it's inaccurate. Some of you will say, but wait a minute, that verse is my life verse. And, and, and you're wrecking it just like you're wrecking the microphone system. You're wrecking it. Uh, so I really don't intend to do that. And by mistranslations, by the way, I'm not talking about whole versions. That is what we sometimes call a translation, like the King James translation. I'm calling those in these lectures, just to be clear, versions. And then I'm talking about translations, that is, particular wordings somewhere in any given or in many particular versions. That's the idea. So by way of introduction, first, we're all inconsistent people. We just don't do anything right all the time. And translators tend to have that happen. I know as a faculty member, as we talk back and forth as faculty members at Gordon-Conwell about passages, and we sometimes do team teaching, and I'll listen to a colleague come up with a rather different understanding of how something should be translated from what I would have thought. Um, we, we realize that there's inconsistency. Um, but this happens in, in every kind of field. No counselor is consistent all the time. No preacher is consistent all the time. And so um, we, can, we can fail. But uh, it's also a question of why. And one of the reasons is that no matter how good we think we are, we've learned some bad habits along the way. We've learned some vocabulary definitions that just aren't what they should be. Um, we've uh, come up with some uh, grammar errors, and, and they're, they're just in us, and we um, commit them on a regular basis, and so on. <coughs> these things really do happen, and we have to be careful. So in these lectures uh, also, I want to say I'm not going to deal with translation issues that are matters of text. I have some things to say about where the ancient texts may have led to a mistranslation, but not because there's a problem with the text, it's just a question of how an ancient version did the translating itself. But there are analogies, and when you think about an important verse like Romans 8.28, you know that most people will quote that by saying all things work together for good. I happen to think, and I may be wrong, but I happen to think that the better textual reading of that in the original is that in all things God is at work for good. In other words, the verse doesn't promise us that everything is somehow good and you just have to figure out how and that nothing is ever really permanently bad. Uh, all things aren't good. They aren't accumulating uh, goodness at all times. There are plenty of bad things and they stay bad. But God is always good and in the midst of the bad things, He's at work. So th that's just a little explanation of that one if that's something you haven't yet had a chance to hear about. Or a simple thing like how tall is Goliath? If you own a tree farm, this is important. You want somebody who can get up there. Anyway. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Septuagint, Goliath's height is four cubits in a span, makes him six feet nine, uh, kind of a, you know, he could be a forward, an NBA four, we could play for the Mavs at six nine. But he's not, I would say, according to the best evidence, nine feet nine. Now why would that be even significant? Well, I think it makes a difference in how one sees the story. If he's really this sort of freakish giant, that's one kind of thing about the story. But if he's a really big, powerful guy, maybe very agile like a forward for the Mavs, that means that David's up against 
someone who might not just be this sort of monster walking into the combat area, but might be somebody pretty agile and pretty dangerous. It could really have an effect about how we appreciate the story and about the guy's theoretical ability to dodge a big rock that comes from David's sling. So there are implications. Now, those are, that's a small potatoes kind of illustration, but there are implications. It can make a difference. Now, especially important for these lectures, and I will remind you of it once in a while as we go along, is the concept, quote unquote, that there is a difference between words and concepts. Many of you know this already, but it's very important to get. So if this is a new kind of thing, if somebody hasn't quite said that to you before, you're new enough at Dallas that you haven't heard that, uh, I just want to talk about that for a second and illustrate it. Um, when we're translating, what we want to get is the truth across. We want to say to our readers in English what God said to those ancient readers in Hebrew through the people that he inspired to write those words. And I mention Hebrew, by the way, because those are, it is Hebrew that we're going to be working from this week. I, I, I am, all my illustrations are Hebrew to English for this set of lectures. So please understand that. And if you want to walk out now, that's okay, because you know, you prepared for Greek and I haven't got any. Um, well, I actually have a little. I'll sneak some in, so stay, please. Um, I do have a little. Um, but there's a difference between words and concepts, and I'd like to illustrate this. You know the parable of the Good Samaritan. Beautiful parable, and it's told by the Lord in response to a question. Who's my neighbor? You know, what, in effect, what does it mean to be a neighbor? If I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, well, you know, what does that mean? So he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a second, but just say even professional translators can know all the definitions of all the words, and they can come up with English translations that really, however, don't mean what the words say. So back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know it's a story about a guy who really does love his neighbor. He sees that somebody suffering in the gutter, left to die by bandits, is in fact a, a person who he ought to love. It's a fellow human being. It's somebody who needs his help. And so he does love him, and, and he loves him just like he would want to be loved. And, and he takes him to the inn and, and pays for treatment for him from the innkeeper and so on and so on. But what's fascinating about the parable of the Good Samaritan, which illustrates how to love your neighbor as yourself, is that in any language you read it in, if the translation is even remotely accurate, it does not contain the word love. And it does not contain the word neighbor. And it does not contain the word self. Read it again. Look for those. Don't look too long because you won't find them. I mean, really, there are other things to do in life. But you will you'll find it's just not there. Yet, it is the greatest illustration in all history of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I know it's an illustration, and I appreciate that's a little different from just a translation of the phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. But there, the concept of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself is conveyed by a story that does not use specific vocabulary words in the Greek that we have it in or in any normal translation of love, neighbor, and self. That always ought to be a reminder to us that there's a difference between words and concepts. And our goal in translating ought to be to get the concepts right, not to ignore the words, not to just say, oh, I have a general idea of what this says, I'll write it my way. No, that's not, that's not correct, but to appreciate the fact that we are communicating concepts. And another analogy that I think is sometimes useful is just to realize that a stack of building materials is not a house. You can have a complete stack of vocab cards and still not necessarily do a very good job of translating. 
You can have memorized a lot of grammatical rules and still not necessarily do a good job of translating. There has to be <coughs> someone who comes along and takes those building materials and shapes them, selects from them, sometimes cuts them up in certain ways, puts them together in all kinds of uh, manners in order to produce a house. And so it is with what we do with our knowledge of the vocabulary and of the grammar and so on and so on. We want to put it together the right way. And so it isn't just mechanistic. It is a kind of intelligent design. Behind a translation, we try as well as we can as humans to uh, effect an intelligent design on material that was intelligently designed by the King of Heaven in the first place, and we owe it to Him to do our best with it. So uh, in this lecture series, we're going to look at some mistranslations and identify them in more than uh, one English version sometimes. We're going to propose <coughs> another translation, a translation that we think uh, is superior. We're going to try to say uh, what's at stake for readers of the Bible. Why is this of any interest? What harm does the mistranslation do? That kind of thing. And then also analyze the reasons behind the mistranslation. Now, you know this is all going to be printed up in Bib Sack, so you can read it there. So uh, right now I'm taking the opportunity to excuse myself and say, anything I don't do well in the lectures, you just have to read in Bib Sack. And then if you read it in Bib Sack and email me, I say, oh, I covered that in the lectures. So I I'm, I'm, I'm confident it's going to go. But seriously, I have had to pray see the articles for the lecture, and there'll be some things I, I don't prove to you. There'll be plenty of assertion compared to proof, and I feel that the, the proof is better left for uh, parts of the articles themselves and the footnotes. But that's the special goal, the fourth one. Why do mistranslations occur? Why do they persist? I think this is practical for everybody. I think it's practical for a reader of the Bible as well as for someone who will work, as many of you will, preparing your sermons and lessons from the original Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. I think it's a good thing to pay attention to, so I, I hope we're going to benefit from it. Now, my first illustration of the two that I want to look through with you today is something that I've called David's near or David's lamp. Here's the situation. In 1968, 45 years ago, a scholar named Paul Hansen <coughs> published an article that a lot of other scholars have taken note of. This is not obscure information. And he titled it, The Song of Heshbon and David's Near. Song of Heshbon is a, a poem in the book of Numbers. And what he did in that poem was to point out something. He pointed out that in that poem, the word near in Hebrew, and uh, there's some Hebrew, that, that stuff there, that's Hebrew. They just wanted to be sure you saw some Hebrew. Uh, anyway, that word is pronounced near, just like English, N-E-A-R, that's how it's pronounced, near. And it's in verse 30, the last verse of the so-called Song of Heshbon, and as he analyzed that uh, song, he concluded that it made sense to translate it not as the word lamp or light, which is what the word near gets translated as everywhere in every extant published English version. They all translate it lamp or light, everywhere it occurs. Now in many places, that is what it means. When you see the word near, it means lamp or light. It's fine, it's okay. But Hansen says, no, it doesn't mean that when you see it in Numbers 2130. It means something else. And furthermore, it also doesn't mean it in four other passages that talk about David's near. David has this near. King David has a near over Jerusalem. So what's going on? Five key places, 
the one I've mentioned, Numbers 21, but also 1 Kings 11 and, and 15 and 2 Kings 8 and 2 Chronicles 21, it has a meaning yoke. Now, you know, a yoke is not the same as a lamp. Most of us would not confuse the two. Most of us would never say, uh, good grief, I've got to buy another bulb for my yoke. So we're clear on this. this. These are two different things. So it turns out that what we've got is a couple of non-homologous homophones. I knew you came looking for that phrase today. Well, you heard it. Uh, non-homologous means just not the same word. Homophones means things that sound the same. And there are in all kinds of languages, and certainly in English, plenty of non-homologous homophones, things that just aren't the same. So what uh, Hansen does in the article, at great length, it's almost boring. In fact, I would say, if you have any trouble with insomnia, read the article, because halfway through you could be out cold. He just goes on and on and on, showing you in other Semitic languages, primarily Akkadian, that the word near, mean, the equivalent of the word near, pr uh, means yoke, not lamp. So he says, what's the point? Why would God say in these passages, uh, and, and the ones that really are significant are the ones that are not in the Song of Heshbon where it doesn't refer to David, but, but in the others where it does refer to David, and it's part of an important messianic promise. It's part of a key Bible promise. He says, why uh, would the Scripture tell us that God has given David a, a yoke in Jerusalem? Well, the point is that it represents a covenant fiefdom. Fiefdom is a kind of fancy word. He wouldn't have had to use that word, but it's a permanent control. Uh, David is going to be the guy who runs Jerusalem. He's in charge of Jerusalem. He's the king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a special place, and he and his descendants forever are the leaders of, the controllers of, the sovereigns over uh, Jerusalem. Well, this is, here's an example. David, my servant, may always have a lamp before him, says the NIV. And uh, I wasn't, I, I did First and Second Samuel, so I don't have no idea who did that. But if I had been there, I would have done that. I would have had it David's lamp and not thought a thing about it. After all, we, knowing the, my experience, we would have had 15 verses to get through before lunch, see? That's how it worked. And we wouldn't waste any time on a word we knew. We know what the word near means. It means lamp. Any questions? We'd say, okay, move on to the next verse. That's what we would have done. And I would have had no questions. I know what the word near means. It means lamp. I would have done it. But the proposed translation is, David, my servant, may always have a yoke, that is a covenant jurisdiction or control or fiefdom before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name, says the Lord. Well, what's at stake? David, uh, his descendants, the ultimate Davidic king, Christ, are promised an unending reign over Jerusalem. That's that's quite a thing. That's a big promise in the Bible. With the final reign, the far, by far the best of all, under a perfect eternal king. So that makes a big difference. That's significant. What Hansen showed, I think I say here, did the world a favor. Well, I think he did. Because he showed there are five passages of the Old Testament, four that refer uh, to the Davidic succession where implications uh, are put right in front of your nose as to why Jerusalem comes to mean heaven. Because, you know, we're all going to live in Jerusalem, right? I don't know what my street address will be, but I'm looking forward to it. What a great place it'll be. The heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and the new heaven and new earth, and we're all going to be there, all citizens of the place that God promised not only to the original David, but to David's greater son, or the ultimate David. And that promise in Scripture makes a lot of passages, even in the book of Revelation, come alive. Uh, this is the place, this is the city where the Son of God, the ultimate David, has a covenant fiefdom. Now, that's a, that's a great thing. It's wonderful to see that. There's just no problem nobody has noticed. Now, you know it, but you're one of the biggest crowds on the planet uh, because 
it hasn't made its way into any of the other journals. Uh, I'm sorry, it has made its way into many journal articles and books and so on, but it hasn't, hasn't made its way in the last 45 years into any published trans, uh, version, in any of the versions. Um, it just hasn't. And uh, why is that so? Why? Well, that's what these lectures are about. Now, I'm actually going to move on now to talk about the still small voice <coughs> because it's even juicier. And I think it's useful. This is one that most of you may uh, have a little investment in, a little emotional investment in. Um, I'm guessing that, uh, like me, um, you've thought about it a lot. And uh, when, when you have read uh, in 1 Kings the story of uh, Elijah experiencing a theophany of God, experiencing an earthquake and uh, a tremendous uh, windstorm and fire on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, where he had gone fleeing from Jezebel who was out to get him killed, um, he uh, is said to have heard uh, a still small voice. God wasn't in the fire and he wasn't in the earthquake and he wasn't in the windstorm, but that still small voice, that's where he was. Psst, Elijah, I got something for you. So it's still small voice. That's my best illustration. I am not a good imitator of God, so you, you, can, you can forgive me. Now, a scholar named uh, Johann Lust uh, wrote in a very prominent journal, Waitus Testamentum, a journal that Old Testament scholars read all the time, pay attention to, uh, this article on those final three words, kol damama dakka, that's the, that's the way it is in Hebrew. And he, he, he titled his article, as you can see, The Gentle Breeze or a Roaring Thunderous Sound. And he did this now back in 1975, so it's not just some very recent thing. And there have been a lot of translations since then. And a lot of scholars have noted it. So uh, uh, Jeffrey Niehaus, who wrote a great book, I recommend it to you, called God at Sinai, all about theophanies and how they work, the whole concept of theophany in Scripture, um, says this. So, so this is his evaluation. So if you, if you disagree with me, blame it on Niehaus, please. Uh, the phrase kol de mama daka is still routinely translated, still small voice, or a gentle whisper, or the like. And then he says, but Johann Lust has ably, ably demonstrated a more appropriate rendering, a roaring thunderous sound, or the like, and he demonstrates it from analysis of the Hebrew roots and so on. That's, that's a little summary from uh, Niehaus's book, God at Sinai. <coughs> but it still isn't in any of the versions that have come out since 75, and there are plenty of those, and even some revisions, and many of the ones that were published before then have gone through revisions and so on. Um, I would say that a lot of scholars really do regard that as a solution, that what List did was an excellent, excellent contribution. I think it's right. It appeals to me. If you read the article, I think you'll um, appreciate it as well. And in fact, if you've got some kind of a tablet or smartphone with you, tune out now and just go back to that uh, article in Waitus Testamentum and read it. It's online, anyway. Uh, so nobody noticed, as it were. How does that happen? Well, here's a, a little analysis, and I've got analysis every day of why these things happen. First of all, people make assumptions. And in this case, it seems to me, everybody has made the assumption that what should happen is that if it says God was not in the earthquake, God wasn't in the fire, he wasn't in the wind, it's got to be the opposite of those. And you know, fire, a big fire, a big earthquake, a big storm, and they're all together, you got to have something tiny and quiet, right? Something like what the word Hevel in Ecclesiastes would describe. This little wisp. That's what it should be. It's just a natural inclination. We just assume, well, if he wasn't in those, by contrast, he must be in this other thing that is the opposite somehow of the way an earthquake or a storm or fire would impress. So it's, it's natural 
instinctive thinking. It's a way of viewing what would be the logical thing. The Septuagint translator. Now, for those of you who know Greek, here it is. I promised you some Greek. There it is, phoneauros uh, leptes, the sound of a gentle breeze. That's how the Septuagint translators did it. Just saying, well, what's the opposite of all that stuff? A fiery, earthquakey windstorm. What's the opposite? How about a nice, gentle breeze? And that worked for them, made sense. They were just translating according to what they thought the context demanded. Jerome in translating the Vulgate, and by the way, the King James translators grew up on the Vulgate, and they're very, very influenced by it. So you can see a lot of things in the King James that came from the Vulgate. Now, the rest of us grew up on the King James, so without realizing it, we too have been influenced by the Vulgate, and because King James set the, the, the tone for so many subsequent English versions. So even the best of us translators have to be very careful. Anyway, Jerome said, got to be the whistling of a gentle wind. So, you know, there's no whistling in there, but that's what he came up with, the whistling of a gentle wind. King James, actually to its credit, <coughs> did not just follow the um, uh, Vulgate as it often does, uh, literally, but they still came up with something opposite of big and noisy, a still small voice. That was their best. They're all doing their best. They're all trying. Nobody was trying to ruin the translation or ruin the passage. Nobody was saying, ha, 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 this will fool seminarians forever. And no, nobody said that. They're all doing their best. But everywhere else in Scripture, as Lust and plenty of others have noticed, whenever God's voice is actually audible, it's really loud. You have that in Exodus where after hearing the Ten Commandments, the people say to Moses, please, please, this is killing us. It is so painful. We're going to die if we have to keep hearing that. Would you please get it from God and say it to us? And there's the origin of what we typically call biblical prophecy. Uh, the people demand it, and afterwards God very graciously does it that way. So it's not that he can't talk out loud. It's not that he can't make those airwaves work. He can do it anytime he wants, but he rarely does it because it's uh, exceptional, and in this case it really is exceptional uh, back there on Mount Sinai. Now, how could, th if this is a mistranslation, if it really is supposed to be a roaring, crushing sound, not a still small voice. How come we're still reading still small voice? First, we who translate, and you got to be careful because if you're working from the Greek and the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and you're doing your translation for your, uh, your lesson or sermon or your Bible study or whatever it might be, um, you just got to be careful. You might also simply be influenced by your predecessors. It's hard not to be. It's hard to go back and do it all from scratch. Furthermore, we're all pressed for time, so whenever I translate, if I come to a word I think I know, am I going to waste time? Am I going to say, oh, I must go and look that up in all the lexicons to see if there's any odd meaning of that and so on and so on. No, only when I can't figure out what it says I might do that. But if I think I know what it says already, then I'm not going to do any further work. So the question is, or a question is, <coughs> excuse me, does it gonna, is it going to do any harm, the still small voice business? Well, you know, sometimes yes and sometimes no. If it's no, remember, often... You might have heard. Somebody might have taught you. You might have taught others. Listen for that still, small voice. You want to know whether you should, after your THM, go on for a PhD? Just listen for that still, small voice. You want to know whether to skip chapel on Friday? <laughs> or whatever. So, you know, God is a wonderful and generous God. He knows what a bunch of lunkheads we are, and He knows how many mistakes we're going to make, and He knows how inclined we are to be lazy and all those things. And he, but fortunately, 
He's generous in his guidance. Fortunately, the Bible's a very big book. It has a lot of safety redundancies. There are a lot of other places in the Bible that talk about how you know his will. And if, you, if you're pushing the still small voice idea, you're going to say, well, that's the only place. I don't see it elsewhere. That, that this is unique. And that'll help you, maybe give you some caution. Um, God's Spirit is at work in us. And so we rejoice that he keeps us out of trouble as much as he does. And, and then other people uh, often help us see the truth. If you go to the Bible study, you go to the class, people say, my version has a footnote or something, if it by any wild chance does. Or I'm a reader of Waitus Testamentum, and I say, well, you know, that would be, that'd be really nice. Um, uh, angels help us. We know that. It's wonderful. And uh, I would be grateful for any angelic help with a translation so I don't teach people what isn't the truth anytime I can get it. And you know, sometimes people are even fortuitously lazy. They just say, ah, I'll, I'll, I'll listen for it sometime, but not yet. Uh, now, if it does harm, what harm could it do? What harm can a mistranslation like that do? Won't God overrule? Won't he step in and make sure no harm is done? Well, first of all, I think one of the harms is overconfidence. In other words, it's possible for people to convince themselves, and hey, I've been a pastor for almost 46 years now, I have seen it done. People convince themselves that they heard a still small voice from God, and I am to be a deacon. Or, I'm to be allowed to preach periodically, or God wants me to be the music director instead of that tone-deaf jerk Mrs. So-and-so, or whatever they come to you with, they've heard the still small voice. I had a friend, someone I admired very much. He had led many people to Christ. He, he was, in my judgment, an exemplary individual, and, and I felt that I learned a lot from him. But he heard a still small voice telling him to divorce his wife and to marry the woman he had uh, not yet a physical affair with, but a romantic affair with. She was married. And uh, eventually, she heard the voice too. And they went off to Reno and got married, leaving a wreckage behind of their, uh, not only their marriages and their families, but of their friendships and of the people who had looked to both of them <coughs> as guides or leaders or examples or anything, just horrendous. So there is the possibility. I've seen it. I've seen people convince themselves by overconfidence because of that idea that there's this still small voice. And that, of course, makes it possible for somebody who wants to uh, work off of his own personal internal impressions to claim to have heard it. Then there's peer pressure. You know, uh, you can be advised, hey, look, you're killing yourself over this problem. You know, you're praying, you're going crazy, you're asking advice and so on. Just sit quietly somewhere, tune out all the world, and listen for the still small. That's how God will communicate with you. And people try this as a method. Maybe you've done it. It's also convenient. Uh, anytime there's not too much noise, but then if you really are a heroic Christian, you can hear a still small voice at a football game or a pep rally or while driving in heavy traffic with the windows down. You can do it because you're able to tune out the world, see, no matter how noisy it is. In fact, I imagine there are some people who feel that a little heavy metal helps them hear <laughs> a still small voice. Just, just, and then they say, out it goes, and I, there's nothing there except that still small voice telling me to drop Syriac, um, <laughs> whatever it might be. So lastly, I'm going to uh, just quickly categorize some flaws. First, um, proper analysis of lexical content is crucial. Uh, there is uh, a range of meaning to words, and there's a range of meaning to the words that are used here. The adjectives one of which means roaring, not still, and one of which means crushing, not quiet or, or the like or thin. And so uh, it's important to appreciate that. And without, you know, I, the evidence is in the footnotes in the article when you finally see it. There's also structure analysis failure. The structure 
of a passage actually helps you figure out what's going on, and you have, but you have to analyze it very carefully. And you can't just say there's only one option, and that is it's got to be the opposite of that storm, fire, and earthquake. What about if it is also severe like they are, but a different thing that's severe? So it's like them in severity, in power, but it's not the same thing. It's God's voice. In other words, it's revelation, not just impression, which is always the case with every, every theophany, every vision, every dream in Scripture. It's always the words that count, not the pictures. Form analysis. This particular mistranslation doesn't appreciate this is a storm theophany, and in a storm theophany, it is supposed to be dramatic. Everything is, in effect, dramatic. And also, biblical context analysis failure. In other words, the conjecture translation, still small voice, misses the broader scriptural context of descriptions of the voice of God. That is it for now. Will you please join me in prayer? Father, thank you for a chance to think about your word. And I ask that if I've gotten it wrong, what you'll still do for all of us is to help us appreciate the fact that translation isn't necessarily automatic or easy. It is important. Learning the original languages is really valuable and appreciating what people who have learned them have written and said and worked on is also valuable. But in every way, your word remains precious, very deeply precious, and we pray that we will be faithful stewards of it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.